Missouri School of Journalism. Welcome to Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. At this year's Academy Awards, a film called Period, End of Sentence won the Oscar for Best Short Documentary. The movie focused on the subject of menstruation taboos in India and the story of a group of poor women who've banded together to manufacture inexpensive menstrual pads. Now, the success of the film gave new visibility to what's often referred to as period poverty. This is usually defined as a lack of access or a lack of money to purchase feminine hygiene project products. Researchers have linked this issue to women's health problems and lower rates of school among teenage girls. And of course, India is hardly the only country where menstruation is a taboo subject. In parts of Nepal, menstruating women have to sleep in huts separate from their families. In Ethiopia, women having their period aren't allowed to attend church services. In other cultures, women are forbidden to bathe, swim, or cook during their monthly cycle. But taboos in period poverty don't just affect women in the developing world, they also affect millions of women here in the U.S. and other wealthy countries. So on this edition of Global Journalist, we're going to learn more about period poverty and some of the ways that stigma about the issue affects women around the world. Before we kick things off, a quick advisory to our audience, this show may contain a frank discussion of menstrual issues. So in a few minutes, we'll hear from three experts who have been following this issue closely. But first, we're joined by Samaya Dabrival in Delhi, India. She's a founder of Project Bala, an organization that does advocacy on this issue and distributes menstrual pads to girls there. Samaya, welcome. Thank you, Jason. Well, it's nice to have you uh, talk to us about your organization. You were a university student in the UK when you got interested in this issue on a trip to Ghana in West Africa. Talk to us about what you saw there. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. Uh, you're absolutely right. I got interested in the topic while I was still at university. So as a um, an economic student at the University of Warwick in England, I got the opportunity to teach math in a few government schools in Ghana. And uh, as a teacher there, there were I would notice that girls would miss up to three to four days of school every single month. And a lot of digging and discreet conversations led me to find out that the reason for that was the inaffordability of safe menstrual product, uh, protection. So. The girls didn't want to come to school because they didn't feel confident enough to be able to manage their period. And this came as a huge shock for me that, um, you know, young girls were losing out on productivity and education because of something as basic as sanitation. Well, and that's, yeah. Well, let me ask you, because your organization does a lot of work on this issue in poor parts of India. What, what, what are some of the taboos or stigmas around menstruation that, that exists there? Um, so, you know, it's, uh, it's amazing to see the kind of beliefs we have here. For example, you know, our uh, ground visits show then in east of India, women do not take a shower or a bath during their period because they believe it leads to infertility. A lot of women do not enter the kitchen and they absolutely do not have any sort of religious practices during uh, their menstrual cycle because they consider to be impure. Um, a, a lot of other places, women sleep on the floor. They're not allowed to use the same bed sheets or the same pillows that they use on regular days. So these are real things that are happening every single day here in India. I mean, what, what, what is the basis of some of these taboos? Is it pure superstition or are some of these rooted in sort of more practical circumstances? Some of them come from practical examples. For example, earlier when women used to go together, you know, to community areas like wells or lakes, etc., to take, you know, to clean themselves, there they were encouraged not to take a bath or use the water because they would pollute the water or they would dirty it because they would all take a bath together um, while they were on their period. Um, so they were encouraged not to do so. And that's kind of permeated through over the years. And because of the misinformation and the lack of conversation, because of the taboos around menstruation, it kind of still exists and hasn't been done anything about. Well, talk to us about some of the practical challenges for poor women in India. What are some of the challenges they have just in managing their period? Um, so most places, affordability is a huge issue because um, a lot of women and girls cannot afford the sanitary napkins or the sanitary products available to them in the market. In addition to that, accessibility is another major issue. So we're talking about rural India. We've got 336 million menstruating women in the country, and they cannot access products even if they're available. So the combination of affordability and accessibility kind of makes them extremely hard for 
many women and girls to kind of get a, get safe menstrual protection and in addition to that the lack of awareness due to the taboos due to the myths around menstruation prevents them to develop an understanding and develop you know the access or create that sort of access for themselves well what are some of the sort of effects or real world consequences on on girls on women on their self confidence I mean, we've seen girls who've come up to us and they've had tears in their eyes when we've given them products that allow them to come to school or go to work. A real life example would be a woman came to us and said that she's going to get three more days of wages every single month now. That's 36 days of wage every single, um, you know, that we're getting every single year that we're getting that woman. Um, I'm sorry. And so this is someone who had received uh, menstrual pads through your organization who felt like she could go to work three more days per month. Yes, and she was extremely happy and she had tears in her eyes because she was getting three extra days, uh, w- uh, days of wage. And these are real life women, real girls and women we meet on field who, whose lives completely change because of one simple product and a facility. Well, your organization, as I understand it, does sort of both education sessions uh, as well as distribute sort of washable, reusable pads to women as well. Let me ask you, how are you received when you show up to a small village in India and say, well, here, we're here to talk to you about menstruation. Right. So uh, the first 10 minutes are the most crucial 10 minutes when we enter the space. So we've created an awareness session, which is extremely, you know, technically designed in a way that uh, we kind of reach the topic of menstruation after talking to them about a lot of other things that kind of touch the topic on the surface, but don't dwell into dwell into it completely. And eventually, once we gain that trust, once we develop that sort of understanding, that's when we even mention the word period or menstruation. Because, you know, even when we tell them that there's something we want to talk to you about that we've not spoken to you about before, they kind of have an inclination or an idea that we're going to be talking about menstruation. A lot of them don't want to turn up because they don't want to talk about it publicly. So we've got this a uh, 10 minute conversation in the beginning that kind of scratches the surface and then we dig in. And, and I mean I mean how 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 are these washable pads received? How is this conversation received? I mean do people see you as sort of importing foreign culture or foreign influences into you know practices that they've been been doing for centuries? So there's a mixed bag of responses. Uh, we're very lucky that we've got a lot of younger generation women and girls who immediately take to the idea and they fall in love with the product because they know practically it's the best solution for them. But then there's a lot of older generation women who kind of, um, you know, the ones who pass on the information and pass on the myths and taboos who challenge us. And I feel like it's very interesting that, you know, our concept at Bala is that we invite different generations of women together for the workshops to be able to tackle exactly this problem, the challenge from the older generations to the younger ones who are willing to accept change. So then it becomes an extremely interesting open conversation where we take the facts that the older generation are putting forward and we kind of, you know, uh, break it down factually and tell them why it may not be practical or applicable in today's day and time. Well, Samaya Dabrival, thanks, thanks so much for taking the time to join us. Thank you so much, Jason. A reminder that this is Global Journalist. On today's program, we're talking about the issue of menstrual taboos and how period poverty affects millions of women without access to safe and effective feminine hygiene products. So to broaden our discussion, we're going to bring in three other people who have been following this issue. Joining us from New York City is Marnie Summer. She's a professor in sociomedical sciences at Columbia University. Marnie, welcome. Thanks. Great to be here. Also with us from Toronto is Sabrina Rubli. She's the director of FEM International, a group that does menstrual education and distributes feminine hygiene products in Africa. Sabrina, welcome. Thank you. And on the line from St. Louis is Ann Siebert Kuhlman. She's a professor of behavioral science and health education at St. Louis University. She's also on the board of Dignity Period, a group that works to address period poverty in Ethiopia. And welcome. Thank you. Well, Marnie, let me start with you. You've been working on this issue for quite some time now. I don't want to say that the topic of period poverty has become trendy, but it it does seem like it's having a moment now, in part as a result of this documentary. Um, I absolutely agree. uh, Periods are having their moment. I've been working on this issue since 2004, and it's tremendously exciting to see all the attention and awareness. Um, The documentary is terrific. I wouldn't say that that actually has catalyzed it. I think the last few years, three or four or five years, there have been a number of really charismatic 
people engaging on the issue, spreading awareness that we need to address the issue. And so the, this was sort of the icing on the cake moment uh, when something, even a, a higher level of awareness has now been uh, raised to the average American or anyone. I don't know how many millions of people tune into the Oscars, but um, or we'll be seeing that documentary. So uh, it's terrific uh, to have it as a conversation starter. And, and as per what was just said, it, it continues this huge important task of breaking the silence on this issue and normalizing uh, all of us, sort of the reality that we should all be able to talk about this and not hide it and not feel ashamed uh, or embarrassed about periods. Well, Sabrina Rubley, if I could bring you in, your organization does a lot of work on this issue in East Act Africa. Um, we heard earlier about some of the challenges for girls in India and the taboos there. What about where you work? How, how, how does the situation look there? So FEM has been working in both Kenya and Tanzania since 2013. Um, primarily, we are an education-based organization, so we really try to deliver health education to women and girls that we work with. Um, because as was mentioned in India, um, menstrual education is very um, limited in East Africa. Um, it is a taboo subject. It is not spoken about as openly as um, we want. Um, it's not taught very often in the curriculum. It's sort of skipped over. And I think that's because the teachers, um, the teachers themselves don't have the tools to teach the subject correctly. Um, and also they, it is a taboo subject, so they don't want to dive into it. And so the impacts of this lack of education means that um, girls struggle to access pads at, uh, during their periods every month. Um, they are, there is a definite financial barrier. Um, and so it's difficult to purchase these items every week or every month, sorry. Um, and also it can be challenging um, to find the products. And so as a result, girls will, women and girls will resort to homemade alternative methods. Um, and while these methods have been used by women for generations, um, they're not always the safest or the most effective. Well, sorry, tell us what some of these homemade alternative methods are. So the most common is rags, um, where they'll wrap rags in their underwear or sew them into their underwear, sort of a makeshift uh, period thanks type underwear. Um, but we've heard of girls using um, newspaper. We've heard of girls using cotton and stuffing um, their underwear with that. Toilet paper, of course. Um, and then in more extreme cases, um, girls will try to wash disposable pads that they have been able to purchase, which of course makes them um, both unhygienic and also ineffective and also not comfortable at all. And then in the most extreme case that I've come across um, was a, a remote um, community using, um, they were making tampons out of cow dung because that's what they had accessible to them. That's what they would use to construct their homes. and. Um, of course, this leads to many different challenges. I mean, we've heard of mud as well. Well, um, well Sabrina, yeah. if I could, if I could just stop stop you there, I want to bring in Anne Sieber Kuhlman then, because Anne, you've worked on sort of public health and reproductive issues all around the world, including here in the United States. Do you see some commonalities across different countries and different cultures on this issue? Oh yes, definitely. I mean, I first came to this issue through working on it with Dignity Period in Ethiopia, and then we started looking and thinking, okay, what do we know about this in the United States, and how do women, particularly low-income women, homeless women, handle it in the United States? And I think the reality is that women are resourceful and creative all over the world. They figure out ways to make do. Um, in our study here in St. Louis, we found women um, making homemade pads and tampons with toilet paper, paper towels from public restrooms, um, old socks and rags similar to what um, Sabrina was saying in East Africa. But um, here we also found women saying that they were, um, that they cut up their kids' diapers um, to make pads for themselves. Because if you're a low income woman um, in St. Louis, it's easier to get um, support and help for diapers for your kids right now than it is to get um, menstrual hygiene products. Well, you know, I, I want to come back to that issue because that is, that is sort of uh, an interesting paradox there. But Marnie, if I could bring you back in as well. Um, I understand that, um, you know, you were talking earlier about how this issue is sort of having a moment now, and of course, um, one of the one of the big ways that this issue is getting a lot of attention now is that there is this link between um, helping girls manage their periods and school attendance as well. And I understand that you've you've been sort of outspoken on that. Talk to us about talk to us about this link and what the research shows. Um, yeah, I, I think there are a number of us who've talked about this issue. I think. 
there is an interest, and I speak probably more uh, what's been happening in low resource contexts and less in the U.S. because the movement in the U.S. is is newer um, in terms of what's been happening. But I, th there is a, I think, a strong desire to show that or to articulate that girls are missing school because of their periods, which, in fact, we know certainly we've all heard. We've all many of us have done research in many countries, and we've certainly heard girls share challenges around engaging in the classroom, going on days when they have their periods, or as was spoken of, because they don't have sufficient products, or even, quite frankly, because there aren't toilets in the school, or there isn't a place to change, even if they have products or teachers who are supportive. So I think it's really a holistic issue that may be impacting girls' abilities to manage periods, whether it's in Tanzania, India, or low-income parts of the US, which is you know data we're all just trying to grasp now. Um, the the attendance link is tricky for a couple of reasons. I think one, my overarching articulation would be, do we need to prove this? It, 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 you know, when it's a, it, females menstruate. It, it's a natural part of our biological function. It, it happens for most once a month. Uh, the ability to manage that, you can't make it stop. Um, and so it's an issue to some degree of gender discrimination, not even to some degree, it is an issue of gender discrimination if girls and, and, and women and people with periods are not able to manage uh, for whatever reason uh, each month. And so do we need to prove that um, school attendance is the reason we should be doing something about that? So that's sort of one vein. The other uh, articulation I would say is we don't have rigorous quantitative data. So by that I mean hard numbers. Uh, that show this direct link. But there are a lot of reasons for that, such as attendance is not necessarily kept carefully in schools. There could be, girls may say I'm sick and not say I have their period, they may be irregular. So it's just tricky to even get that data that everybody would like to see. Well, Sabrina Rubley, one of the programs that your organization, Femme International, does, I understand, is to distribute menstrual cups. Um, you, people can even go to your website and pay to donate uh, a cup to a girl in East Africa. Tell us about these, why you think they're a good solution to some of the challenges that girls there face. Sure. So menstrual cups, um, they've been around for since the 1930s, actually. Um, they're made out of surgical grade silicone, and they kind of look like an upside down bell. I suppose would be the shape, um, and they're inserted into a woman's vagina to collect rather than absorb menstrual fluid. Um, so when they're inserted correctly, they're very comfortable, um, you don't feel it. Um, it's extremely safe to wear, you could wear it for up to 12 hours, um, and then they can be reused for up to 10 years. Um, so they're an incredibly sustainable, incredibly environmentally friendly, incredibly cost effective solution for, uh, for menstruation. Um, we have been distributing these to women and girls in East Africa. Um, and we've had a lot of success with them. There's definitely an age group that is more comfortable to use them. So women sort of above the age of 18, 19, 20 are much more comfortable choosing um, the cup option. We always make sure to give women a choice between reusable pads or menstrual cups because um, we feel that that's a choice that they should be making for themselves. But the women who do choose the menstrual cup really um, appreciate the fact that they can wear it all day. Um, as was mentioned, many schools in low income communities in East Africa don't have adequate latrines and so this is a reason why girls would leave school um, in the middle of the day because they would have to clean themselves um, and they couldn't use the toilets at the school so a menstrual cup eliminates that it helps women stay at work all day um, and of course there's the financial benefit um, to being able to reuse it for so many years a reminder that you're tuned into Global Journalist. I'm Jason McClure. On today's program, we're talking about period poverty and how menstruation taboos affect the health and well-being of millions of women around the globe. If you're interested in more Global Journalists, check us out online at globaljournalist.org. There you can find our archives and additional coverage of underreported international news and human rights issues. You can also like us on Facebook, where we live stream, follow us on Twitter, subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, or see our video cast on YouTube. And Anne Siebert Kuhlman, if I could bring you back into the conversation then. You had referenced earlier this uh, research that you recently published about how period poverty affects women in St. Louis there. Talk to us about sort of the size and scope of what you found there. Were, were you surprised with what, you, what, what your study showed? 
Yeah, I think we were really surprised about the magnitude, the extent. So we found in our study that um, 64%, so nearly two thirds of the women that we surveyed reported that in the last year they had needed period products and could not afford them. Um, and for about 20% uh, of those women, it was an issue that they faced every month. So every cycle they needed products and they didn't have money to buy them. And, I mean, it seems like, as we mentioned, this issue is getting more attention lately. I understand in the UK, the government recently passed a law to provide menstrual products for free in secondary schools. But I understand that in Missouri and a number of other states, there's actually, I think it's what activists call a pink tax on, on feminine hygiene products. Tell us about that. Yeah, so the pink tax refers to the fact that um, in many places, including Missouri currently, um, that period products are taxed at the highest sales tax rate, the luxury tax, and that many states have a reduced tax for um, sales tax for food, medical products, or they have no tax on, on those products. Um, and so period products really, they're not a luxury. They're something that everyone who has periods needs. And um, having them taxed at that, that highest sales tax rate is really a tax, an extra tax on women and on, on people who are having their periods because they, they have to have these products. Oh, well, Marnie Summer, Talk to us just about how we should think about this issue. I mean, is this is this something that's primarily, you know, a public health issue? Is it an issue of human rights? Is it sort of like a, a water and sanitation issue? I mean, it seems like there's a, a nexus with a number of different uh, of different areas. It's a great question. I think it depends what orientation you're coming from. For sure, it's a human rights issue. I think there's been people out there who've written about that. Many of us have been working hard. We just had a, a great meeting in Geneva where we tried to bring together high-level people working in education, in gender, sexual reproductive health, psychosocial health, along with people who've been working on the issue of menstruation for years to say, okay, you're trying to achieve uh, shifts in education, enrollment completion, you're trying to reduce rates of early marriage, unwanted pregnancy, you're trying to uh, make sure girls feel more confident, you're trying to ensure there's adequate toilets and water. So how can we marry what we're trying to do, which is address the fear, shame, discomfort girls are uh, feeling around their first period, the challenges they face, as, as the others have mentioned in school, in the workplace. How can we marry what we're trying to do with your priorities so that we can be more synergistic in our efforts. Um, I think one of the reasons it has sometimes slipped through the cracks is that because it's so relevant across all those areas, it's hard to get donors or funders or governments to focus in on it because it doesn't neatly fit into one category. It's really relevant across the spectrum. It's, it's relevant to decisions around having children about, um, it, you know, anyway, it's a range of things, but I would say it's, it's relevant across the board, and, and that's something we've been trying to speak about in a way that we can maybe bring together people uh, so that we join forces and have more impact. Well, Sabrina Rubli, if I could ask you as well about uh, this, one of the strategies of your organization and, and a number of other organizations is to distribute feminine hygiene products to poor uh, women in different countries. There was an opinion piece in the New York Times by a University of Massachusetts professor last year sort of being critical of this approach of a lot of NGOs saying that there's just a lot of focus on sort of a technological solution to sort of helping women manage their periods and that in fact in many of these poor countries, you know, using cloth strips can be sort of a perfectly fine way to manage their periods and that there isn't really enough emphasis on on focus on fighting stigma or taboo i mean how, how do you respond to those types of criticism i mean there's loads of organizations out there and really well-meaning volunteers that do exactly that they go into communities and they distribute um, reusable pads or sometimes even disposable pads um, with very limited or even no education at all. And that is absolutely not the approach that we take with FEM International's programs. Um, we are primarily education based. So we make sure that before any girl receives a product, um, she's gone through a really comprehensive educational set, um, workshop where she's learning not only about what the menstrual cycle is, but also how it relates to her overall health. We talk about um, female anatomy, we talk about puberty, we talk about um, 
all sorts of questions that come up surrounding menstruation and why um, it's important to talk about and important to um, manage in a very safe way. And so at the end of the workshop, the girls do get a choice of product, whether it's a menstrual cup or a package of reusable pads. Um, but we know that a lot of girls will continue buying the disposable pads when they're able to because that's what they prefer. And that's completely fine. And we also know that a lot of women continue using um, the strips of cloth that they've been that they've grown up with and again that is fine we just hope that they're doing it in a safe um, hygienic way that doesn't cause um, infections and it doesn't cause discomfort to them so you're right just distributing a product is absolutely not a sustainable solution um, but when it's incorporated with comprehensive health education as well as normalizing and reducing the stigma through a conversation at the community level um, I think it can be a really effective um, component of a, of a, a menstrual health program. And Ann Siebert Kuhlman, I know that your research on this issue in, in St. Louis, in inner city St. Louis, it got a lot of attention in part just because of sort of the scale of the findings that you had there. What, what do you have planned going forward? Like what's the logical next step in, in looking at this issue in the U.S.? Yeah, so there are a couple of important next steps. One, um, we're currently working on a store audit to look at um, where products are available, sort of similar to the idea of food deserts that have been documented in many urban areas in the United States, but these are non-perishable um, goods. But those um, findings we're looking at right now, we're interested in expanding and looking at the need um, in rural areas and also looking at the economic impact. So, you know, we have these stories of women saying they're missing um, work, school, girls missing school, but what's the overall economic impact um, of the period of poverty? And Marnie Sommer, uh, if I could, if I could bring you back in as well. I mean, we spent some time talking about different sort of taboos and challenges here, and Anne has done some research, you know, showing about showing sort of the scope of some of the the issues here in the United States. I mean, talk to us just a, a little bit about the taboo and stigma here in our own country, in our own culture. Yeah, no, great question, and and I love knowing more about Anne's work. We because it's only in the last year that I have shifted with my team to look in the U.S. and we've been talking to girls in low income uh, schools or low income girls in schools in L.A., Chicago, and New York, and hearing about embarrassment in the classroom, about not being able to um, use the toilet when they need to use the toilet, about challenges around not understanding what product is right for them or not feeling supported when they get their first period. I think that speaks to something that came up earlier in this program around many parents and caregivers themselves don't feel comfortable talking about this topic and it's not necessarily mandated to be covered in the school curriculum. I, I think there's only 20 something, 23 or 24 schools across the U.S. that have um, some kind of mandate around sex ed and then I think sometimes the battles around sex ed um, take on sort of any kind of inclusion of puberty and menstruation and, and content that perhaps would be um, would have an easier task uh, of being inserted into school curriculum. So I think it, it, it ends up creating this more pervasive ongoing silence around the issue uh, or treating it like something that we all have to hide and, and can't talk about it. Um, so I think all the attention that shows like this are bringing um, will help to address that. Well, we're out of time for this edition of Global Journalist, a production of the Reynolds Journalism Institute at the Missouri School of Journalism and KBIA Mid-Missouri Public Radio. Many thanks to Samaya Dabriwal, Marnie Summer, Ann Siebert Kuhlman, and Sabrina Rubley for joining us. Our assistant producers this week are Gael Fournier, Annie Lay, and Connor O'Halloran. Rosie Belson is our supervising producer. Megan Smaltz is visual editor. Aaron Hay is audio engineer, and Travis McMillan is director. For all of us at Global Journalist, I'm Jason McClure. Thanks for tuning in.